Welcome to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. No wonder Extinction Rebellion is in overdrive. Despite publicly backing the 2015 Paris deal to limit global temperature rises, $1 billion has been spent on PR or lobbying by ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, Total and BP. Their aim? To operate and expand fossil fuel operations. But what if these archaic players are fighting the last war? What if their industry is about to undergo a shift that will render their current polluting business model obsolete? What if the market, not policymakers, is now picking a cleaner, more efficient way to produce our energy? Joining me to discuss how we've reached peak fossil fuels and are now making the shift to renewables is the energy strategist at Carbon Tracker, Kingsmill Bond. Kingsmill, welcome. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming by. We often hear peak oil and the shift to renewables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't really know, I certainly don't really know, how to position myself, ourselves, in the timeline. Mm -hmm. Where are we? What's the current reality? Are we at peak fossil fuels? Is this amazing renaissance of renewables coming? Where are we? Well, as you know, the, the amazing renaissance of renewables is happening um, in spite of uh, many attempts to stop it. You keep on getting very rapid growth of, of solar, of wind, of batteries, and now uh, allied to digitization. So the very rapid growth of renewables is happening. The real question is, at what point will it drive a peak in demand for fossil fuels? And the answer is in the early 2020s. If these technologies continue on current growth rates, S-curves, uh, then we'll see peak demand for fossil fuels in the early 2020s. How many people are accepting that new reality who, and let me qualify it, mm -hmm. who are entrenched players within the fossil fuel industry? Well, of course, the entrenched players within the fossil fuel industry, like all incumbents before them, and always deny the reality of what's going on. And there are four very good examples of recent industries where this has already happened. What so, are they? Uh, you have the European electricity sector, where demand for thermal electricity peaked in 2007, not foreseen by the incumbents. Uh, you have the global coal sector where demand peaked in 2013. Again, not foreseen by any of the forecasters, right. um, even long after the event. Then you have um, the global turbine market where uh, actually demand peaks around 2011. And then GE buys Alstrom in 2013, fails to understand what's going on. It takes a $20 billion write down yes. a couple of years later. And lastly? Um, and then lastly, of course, you have the global car industry right. where the car sector long denied the, the threat of the electric vehicle. And of course, we've seen a complete transformation of their attitude in the last two years. And that's at a time when there's a thousand million cars on the road and only five million EVs. The entire global sector has realized that they need to transition to the new technology. So actually, the peak can happen very, very quickly. And the financial market consequences are felt very soon. How many of the uh, fossil fuel incumbents at the moment are actively waylaying uh, if you like, the renewables, the shift to renewables. And, and does that happen? Because I don't know whether there are urban myths or not, but you know, there's a lot of chat out there about you know, taking patents out of the market because mm -hmm. they're lazy, the fossil fuel lot, and actually being a hindrance, really, to this movement. I, I don't actually think this matters. I mean, urban myths are always fun, but as with all previous transitions, incumbents may or may not seek to frustrate change, but they find it very hard to stop it. Right particularly when, as now, these technologies are on, uh, on, on learning curves, where the costs fall by 20% for every doubling in capacity. And to put some numbers around this, I mean, the, the amount of investment in the renewable sector last year was over $300 billion, and the oil sector maybe invested sub $10 billion. So it's, it's actually not a player. They're merely the victims, not the drivers of change. Then when you look wider, um, because what you're actually getting at is a very natural mm. flow, because the economics are actually you know, staring people in the face. Are there businesses now who are uh, positioning themselves for this shift? And if they are, who are they? And who are the people who are sort of leading this change? It is, of course, a fabulous opportunity. Whenever you get 20% annual growth rates for, right. for a decade or more, you get a lot of new companies jumping in in order to, to avail themselves of the opportunity. One of the interesting aspects about this uh, this revolution is that many of those companies are in China. Right. Um, so you see a lot of new electric vehicle companies uh, in China. You see Chinese companies dominating the shift to solar. You see Chinese companies dominating in, in uh, long distance transmission of electricity, in electric bikes, I mean, lots of new areas. What this means is it gives 
these companies an opportunity to get global leadership in sectors where they have hitherto been laggards. So, for example, the automotive industry, dominated by the West, but actually now gives a no, new opportunity to, to new players to come in. And we see it's not just China. I mean, you've got software companies in California. You've got innovators, entrepreneurs in Germany, all across the world. This is the most extraordinary uh, amount of creativity as a result of the cost falls which have made this all possible. If we look at um, economies, though, um, sovereign nations, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what are the effects on, on the poor, people now being able to access uh, distributed energy? What, what does that do to economies? What does that do to local communities? If in the past you were dependent upon buying fossil fuels from abroad yeah. and, and building very complex systems in order to get that energy to, to, to people who are widely distributed, your ability to grow was constrained. Some countries are spending up to 10% of GDP on importing the fossil fuels. So you, you find it quite hard to develop. Right. In, in this environment where you can get cheaper distributed renewable sources, it gives the opportunity for much uh, larger degrees of local distributed energy. Therefore, that's quite democratizing. And we see as a result, many cities uh, and regions having their own energy policy and, and, and I think we'll see a lot more of that. And, and generally, providing the opportunities for local communities to, to determine their own energy future, I think, is quite positive for everyone. The um, allocation of funds, then, that a government would <laughs> use to protect uh, or uh, the infrastructure that they'd have mm -hmm. to upkeep um, and the GDP that would be soaked up, if you like, mm -hmm. to, uh, for use within the fossil fuel game, mm -hmm. where can that money then be funneled? Because that is something that isn't talked about a lot. I mean, the amount of money and effort and, and manpower it takes to, for energy security, as it were. Is it possible, or is this very naive, that actually you can just shift that and say, well, I'm going to start building hospitals, I'm going to start building schools? Yeah, I think that's precisely what will happen. You'll get a massive global new energy dividend as you can reduce the amount you're, you're spending on, on defence and on fossil fuel imports. You then transition that to domestic sources of energy um, which creates more domestic employment um, and, and is consequently more, more equitable. And this is something that's often missed in the debate, that eight out of 10 people live in countries that import fossil fuels. So for most people in the world, it's, it's a huge benefit to have their own energy source. What we've seen in other energy transitions from you know, all the way back to uh, Holland finding um, gas or, or, or the UK exploiting coal in the 19th century, Whenever a country finds a domestic source of energy, they eventually figure out how to use it, and they figure it out quite quickly. And now suddenly, we're in the position where every country in the world has got a huge new source of domestic energy. It's very inspiring. Why is that bit missed mm -hmm. in the debate? Specifically, actually, we can uh, move resources from, let's say, the legacy mm -hmm. of fossil fuels, and we can shift that mm -hmm. to a, a more effective source of investment. Why is that bit missed? I don't think it's missed, actually. I mean, there are quite a few people who are talking about this as an opportunity. But of course, hitherto, the debate is very much dominated by incumbents. Right. And those people who are unable to conceive of a new world, should we say, to put it politely. Is it the Upton Sinclair idea that a man's uh, salary depends on him not understanding something? I, indeed. It's quite interesting. We've seen this consistently. The, first of all, there's a group of people who deny there was global warming, and then now the same group of people is denying there's an energy transition. Um, <sighs> and, and actually, the key point I think we try to make is by doing this, they're damaging their own interests. So for companies which, which fail to realize like what's going on, like GE or like Peabody, um, or like Volkswagen, um, or like RWE. But there, there's a, you know, a there's long list. plenty of them. Right. If you fail to realize what's going on and you deny reality and you pay lip service, you go bust. And that complacency is driven by? Well, you're up to Sinclair quote, I guess. I mean, it's also very difficult, don't forget, if you're an incumbent, you've got your entire balance sheet committed to the current system and you're trying to compete with people who've got their entire balance sheet committed to the new system. So it's very, very hard to make the transition. There's certain companies like, like Dong, now Ostead, which have been able to do that, but you need quite visionary leadership. And they're a Danish-based yes. outfit. Yes. Well, they tell us a bit about So they, well, they just transitioned from being Danish oil and natural gas to being a, one of the, the world's leading um, wind developers. It was obviously given Denmark's location, it makes sense, because. Here's another example of a lot of local energy just offshore, um, which they were able to exploit. And I think we'll see other companies doing something similar. You can have all this technology, mm -hmm. 
and we can understand the geopolitical and we can understand the macro trends. But if the leadership isn't in place, then you're going to, uh, well, have a problem really pushing these companies to the, the, the new world or uh, a new world, as you call it. How do you deal with that? You need new leaders. Many of the leaders of the current fossil fuel industry are clearly not fit for purpose. If you go back and read the annual reports of the European electricity companies in 2007, you see all of the leaders of these companies paying lip service to a transition, talking about how important it is privately. It's all greenwashing. Privately, right. um, we know that they were dismissing it, they didn't see it as a real threat, and they felt that they could ignore it. But in their public statements, they were very positive. Of course, what happened, was that over the course of the succeeding decade, these companies ended up um, losing hundreds of billions of dollars of stranded assets, losing up to 80% of market capitalization, and their management teams were replaced. And, and I think we, what we saw happen to the European electricity sector a decade ago is what will now happen increasingly across the, the fossil fuel complex. The idea that it's apocalyptic is uh, wrong because I think apocalypse gets wrongly um, referenced. Apocalypse, in the Greek true uh, sense, is a revealing of new knowledge or a lifting of the veil. Are we at that point? No, it's not apocalyptic at all. It's just a shift. I mean, we've had plenty of shifts. We're very used to dealing with this in financial markets. You move from one environment to another environment. You have a period of um, transition. You get a period where, where people struggle to see what's going on and then they understand and then you reinvent yourself. And that's one of the glories of capitalism is that it tends to react relatively quickly um, because capital flows to the new and abandons the old. And I believe that the current degree of underperformance of the fossil fuel sector is acting as a bit of an early warning system to encourage people to make that shift. Welcome back to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more with the energy strategist Kingsmill Bond about peak oil and the inevitable shift to renewables, let's have a look at what you've been tweeting about in this week's Renegade Inc index. First up, we have a tweet from Joanna Flisowska. Clean fossil fuel energy doesn't exist. While some might still promote it, it's only very costly illusion. Today at COP24, dozens protested against US government greenwashing world must go beyond coal and hashtag keep it in the ground. What's your view on that? The world does need to move and the world is moving and it's a combination of necessity because of global warming, necessity because increasingly in places like India people can't breathe with the amount of fossil fuels that are being burned right now and fortunately economics. Next from Carbon Action Now, all wealth on earth has been generated without paying for the environmental services of the earth, notably the oceans and the atmosphere. The debt is now being called in. There's every reason why major funding for the energy transition should come from a wealth tax. Next, from Kurt Hackbath, a couple of tweets actually. Uh, you know what you do with fossil fuel companies that are raking in billions while actively blocking any attempts to fight climate change. You nationalize them and use the nation's energy resources to transfer to a 100% renewable economy. Uh, controversial, but he continues, plenty of nations have their energy resources in public hands. Only in the US is this considered such a radical idea. Our oil and gas don't belong to Exxon or Chevron or any of them any more than the wind or water do. And the fiction that they do is killing us. Well, it's not necessarily a great idea to nationalize an industry which is going nowhere. I, I can't stress enough that what the current fossil fuel industry does is not going to change very much. It can fight like King Canute against change, but change is going to happen anyway. Finally, from uh, War on the Rocks, oil will remain the world's largest source <laughs> of energy for the foreseeable future, and the balance of global supply and demand remains perilously narrow. Kingswell, you're here with a different message to that, really, aren't you? Well, that's factually correct, no mm -hmm. question. But don't forget, horses were the largest source of global uh, transport supply in 1910. But they spent the next 50 years declining. And that's the point. You're going to reach the peak 
just before you decline. Uh, our book of the week this week, A New World, uh, The Geopolitics of the Energy Transformation. Uh, you were a significant contributing author to this. Can you pitch this to us in a sentence? I know it's the most so difficult thing it, to In get. one sentence, energy determines geopolitics, therefore a new energy environment will mean a new geopolitical environment. My name is Bruce Davis. I'm co-founder and joint managing director of Abundance Investment. We are a crowdfunding company funding renewable energy and socially useful projects in the UK. Abundance Investment was founded uh, six years ago had a simple idea which was to allow anyone to invest directly into projects and businesses that they cared about. Um, in those six years we've raised just short of £90 million from small investors using their ISA, which is their individual savings account, which means they invest from £5 and get a tax-free return by backing different projects, whether that's wind farms, solar parks or more recently things like tidal energy and energy from waste. So we're here in the middle of Solar Park, which is Swindon Common Farm Solar Park, which is a five megawatt solar farm, which was funded by local residents investing through their ISA and is generating energy for the local area, but is also generating benefits for the local council who take a return on the investment that they made alongside local residents, but also from things like business rates, which are allowing them to fund uh, frontline services. When we started out, the renewable energy industry was very much an interesting niche uh, who were disrupting the energy market. Over time, that industry has grown and matured, particularly with the growth of the offshore wind industry. And mainly through you know, the backing of government subsidies has, has grown to quite a scale. So now perhaps we have about a third of the UK's energy generated from renewables. Over the last sort of six, ten years, the main driver of that growth has been government subsidy because renewables have to are generally involved big upfront capital investments and those are financed over the long term. So the subsidy has had a function of allowing us to lend money, as our investors did here, up to 20 years against these projects, which allows them to be developed. The growth now, though, is really about economics. So the economics of solar, the economics of wind are now cheaper, essentially, to generate new wind versus, say, new gas generation or other forms of fossil fuels. So really now it's becoming a more straightforward fight in the market. So the biggest challenge is a financial one. So the Bank of England have highlighted that uh, climate change represents a material financial risk and it's also a, a risk to the finance system. The main problem is there's about $30 trillion invested into the fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuel assets. And they predict that over time that needs to reduce to 15 trillion um, if we're going to meet our targets. And, a, and a, that, that money is transferred into renewable energy uh, generation, but also they say into energy efficiency. So there's a huge transfer of assets from one type of industry to another. And at some point in that process, people are going to feel the crunch. They're going to feel some sort of pain in terms of the financial system. So the main thing the Bank of England is actually focused on is how it allows that transition to occur without the sort of crash that we saw in 2008. As you sit here in 2019 and having given this an enormous amount of thinking time, how does, let's say, the next 25 years play out geopolitically? Because we know that oil has been the source of an awful lot of war, conflict and bloodshed over the years. So I think we live in a world very much dominated by the geopolitics of fossil fuels. If you think about the alliances, the pinch points, the links um, between uh, countries and the fossil fuel sector very, very deep, um, we are now shifting to a world where fossil fuels are being replaced by renewables. We'll end up eventually in a world where um, the primary energy source is, is renewables. And that, I think, will have three quite significant consequences. First of all, you get Energy Independence Day right. for all the countries which are currently importing a lot of fossil fuels. That means a very different political environment for them. It also means that they can possibly grow faster, they can have more local jobs. Give us an example um, of one of those countries. So a country like India, right. for example, where up to half of their imports have been historically spent on the import of fossil fuels. And where now 140 million people are breathing air, which is 10 times over the World Health Organization recommended limit. It's, it's quite chilling. So actually they can solve a number of birds with, with one stone by implementing new fossil fuels. They can both improve the health of their people and reduce their imports. And that will therefore, all things being equal, tend to drive faster domestic growth, but also reduce um, pressures upon the currency. So we should actually see 
the rise of some of these emerging market currencies. But there are other aspects of the transition which are also important. The second one to highlight is that fossil fuel exporters uh, will clearly see a decline in their influence over time. And, and then thirdly, you will see a, a rise in influence of the countries which dominate these new energy technologies. So places like Iceland for geothermal, or Denmark for wind, or China in many aspects of the transition. When you think about the geopolitical shakeup, if you like, um, the US hegemony uh, mm -hmm. is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. We can see that mm -hmm. insofar as currency, the mm -hmm. petrodollar. Mm -hmm. Um, what else do you see insofar as a new world order, as it were? The most interesting aspect of this shift to a new energy source is that it's led, of course, by China. So it's clearly another pillar in the rise of China to greater global power, should we say. Um, and, and it's very notable that whilst the US has been going backwards under its current uh, president, China has been moving forwards and has been implementing both leading these technologies, but also they have a number of very clever policies. So for example, the Belt and Road is a way of, of expanding Chinese power through land-based systems. And I think there's one other general point to make, which is that if you are, as I think you are, a student of Mackinda, you will recognize that sea power has been intrinsic to the dominance of the US and sea power in order to protect fossil fuel transport. Now, of course, if it's electricity, which will be the dominant source of links of, uh, and transmission of energy between countries, it will be... Land power. So it's land power. Wow. Um, what does that mean? That, again, is where it's been quite impressive how China's using the Belt and Road to increase uh, its, its, its land power to its neighbours. Very briefly, what is the Belt and Road, for people who don't understand that term? So, so the Belt and Road is a series of infrastructure, transport, and energy initiatives whereby Chinese capital and Chinese expertise is going to a series of countries in order to expand their infrastructure links. When uh, we look at the different countries, how does Russia, for instance, uh, and I know you spent a lot of time there, you've worked there for many years, how, what, how does Russia fit into this story? On the one hand, there's a very obvious threat for Russia. Russia's the world's largest exporter of fossil fuels, that's understood. But at the same time, um, there's really some tremendous opportunities. So on the one hand, Russia can avoid the kind of ideological uh, error which is being made by the United States right now, um, or the kind of errors being made by the UK government investing in a dying technology like Hinkley Point in nuclear. Right, um, the greatest white elephant. Yeah, so, so Russia can have a much more pragmatic approach to what's going on and tailor its policy to suit its interests. I think, secondly, uh, Russia, of course, is, is gifted with tremendous renewable resources, both in terms of wind, and solar, and of course, industrial expertise. Uh, and it's notable that some of the leaders in Perovskites, for example, are Russian. It's notable that one of the commissioners for this report was the great Anatoly Chubias. Mm. And therefore, I think it's very, very clear that Russia can seize the opportunity, as it has done in the past, to be a major player in this new world. And, and then the third point is because of Russia's location, its geostrategic location, it of course can act as, well, as the world's battery. Um, both right now in order to balance the variability of renewables with its fossil fuel resources, but also in the future because of its location to act as a kind of central environment for, for, for global electricity grids. Let's take three groups of people, you and I, man on the street, mm -hmm. uh, investor, and then the politician. What would you say to each of those people having thought about this for as long as you have? Well, I guess a carbon tracker, we'd be talking about the woman on the street, but um, the first point I guess to be made is that, as so often, people are ahead of politicians. There's a great desire globally to shift to renewable energy sources. Um, and you see it in poll after poll, uh, even in the US actually, um, but particularly in Europe and China and India. Probably the second group of people to wake up to what's happening has been the investors, because investors of necessity are impacted by marginal change. And, and our whole observation is that the, the growth increasingly now is coming from renewable energy sources. And then the third shoe to drop probably will be politicians, because one of the arguments we seek to make is that the economic tipping point, which has happened or happening, will drive a political tipping point where it becomes increasingly apparent to a new generation of politicians that you can actually have your cake and eat it. You can have less pollution, lower costs, and more votes by switching to this new system. And dare I say it, less war? Well, that's a long-term aspiration, but certainly a global environment where people have their own energy 
and are not dependent upon chasing after limited amounts of fossil fuels will certainly be a less stressful environment. What would you say to the incumbent? Evolve or die? Evolve or die, yeah. As in so many other sectors. I mean, they're not, it's not new uh, technology-driven disruption. What is different in this particular instance is the very large size of the current fossil fuel sector. I mean, we have $25,000 billion worth of fixed assets that will certainly need to um, be replaced by the end of the century, and quite a lot of it will need to be written off at some stage. That causes a lot of stress. But I, I think in this report, we're not, I don't think we're, we're especially naive. We're saying, look, there's a lot of short-term pain for some very significant long-term benefits. Now, the short-term pain is you know, the risks of financial disruption, the, the impact on the incumbents, the stranded communities uh, which arise, the costs of the transition, the upfront costs of the transition. So there's undoubtedly short-term short -term pain. pain. Yes. Global warming is also a massive stress multiplier. Right. And therefore, this is one of the tools to resolve and reduce that. We'll reduce the, the migration pressures, we'll uh, reduce the, the stresses between countries. And that's another very, very clear benefit. Give us a date when this pragmatic utopia will exist. We at Carbon Track have written a report um, on the energy transition. We've said that from our calculations, you will see peak fossil fuel demand in the early 2020s, 2023 to be precise. The point then from a geopolitical perspective is that people look ahead. And, and one error that's very, very often made is people say, well, we're a very long way from renewables being 100% of all energy. Therefore, when it's 100% wake me up. Well, <laughs> well, of course, that's not how the world works. Right. The world works on, on marginal change, basically. And it's very, very notable, for example, that when we switched from wood to coal after 1800, actually, coal doesn't become the largest global energy source until 1905. But the whole of the 19th century was the working out of the consequences of the rise of those countries which exploited this new energy technology. So if you are looking at the percentage share and thinking that's gonna protect you from transition, you are being delusional. Wonderful, thank you very much. That's it from Renegade Inc HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com or you can tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently, but until then, stay curious. Mm -hmm.